Good morning, everyone. I'll just get this out of the way at the moment. Just in case you're looking at this fluff on my face. I'll just, uh, uh, I'm doing it for a good cause. My daughter in the hairdressing uh, course needs to uh, uh, shave a, a beard. Needs to. So I'm throwing so this. <laughs> I've had one offer. I've had, I've had one offer. I've had one offer already. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want to speak this morning about forgiveness. And uh, it, it's one of those subjects which um, uh, constantly comes up in our scriptures because at the end of the day, I mean, that's really what Jesus was, was about. And uh, when I uh, uh, read this uh, uh, passage, there's, there's one verse in particular which, which really uh, uh, sticks with me. Where Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And Jesus is referring to the executioners, and uh, I guess to the, to the people who sentenced him to death. But it always struck me as odd in some ways, because the executioners actually did know what they were doing. They were extremely well versed in the art of execution. In fact, um, they were uh, really proud um, to make the, the person on the cross to live as long as possible so they could suffer as much as possible. Jesus was scourged, and uh, that means that he was uh, flayed with a whip before ever he went out to carry his cross. And it wasn't just ordinary whips that they, that they used. They used to use whips with pieces of glass in it, even with hooks. And so as they would flay uh, the back of the legs and the backside and, and, and the back, if there were hooks in there, as they pulled the whip back, it would take lumps of flesh away. They actually, um, if you can believe it, uh, got to the stage where they put a seat on the cross. That wasn't to make the person more comfortable, um, because most people died of asphyxiation on the cross. It was to make them sit up so they wouldn't die of asphyxiation, so they would last longer and suffer longer on the cross. But what did Jesus say? Father, forgive them, but they know not what they do. Incredible. And you know, we we get really aerated, don't we, about the smallest little thing. And you know, we, we we get excited about stuff that goes on in church, perhaps, which is unimportant. You know, when we when we see the problems of the world. And then we actually figure out how we, we get angry with people. It's really a waste of, waste of our breath. And I was, uh, as I was preparing the sermon, um, I do a lot of uh, sermon diversion. You know, I, I go on the World Cup site and, you know, and all that stuff. And, and I was uh, on, um, I went to uh, the Willow Creek site because I'm going there in a in the summer uh, to a conference and I just wanted to check out the speakers. And I pressed the wrong button and I came up uh, with uh, Bill Hybels talking about forgiveness. And forgiveness has been sort of on my heart for the last couple of weeks. It's been in my, my quiet time readings and two weeks ago on our Wednesday morning service it was about forgiveness. So it's just been there all the time. And, and Bill Hybels um, he's a very wise guy. Uh, he said, you know, I, it helps me to put, for, you know, uh, uh, wrongness, you know, doing, doing wrong in, in kind of three categories. He said there's the unimportant category, category number one, which is unimportant. Minor irritations, you know, the sort, the next door neighbour, all his grass clippings go on your driveway every time he, he cuts grass. How do you 
many times have we read in the papers or seen on the television? People actually kill because of dispute over, over the hedge or the, the, the tree. It doesn't matter, does it? What about when we're in, in the car? Think about that. How angry we get when somebody cuts us up. What does it matter? As long as we're safe. What does it matter? And these minor irritations. Bill Hybels has a, 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 a great phrase for it. He says, look, these minor irritations, they don't need forgiveness. Because at the end of the day, we should overlook them. And he calls it everyday grace. Everyday grace. And, you know, it, it, all the time it happens to us, doesn't it? People annoy us. I know it, it, it does with me. You know, and, and, and I, when I do these sermons, I preach as much to myself as I do to anybody sat here. And, 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 and Bill says, overlook it. It is everyday grace. Grace. The second one he talks about is a little bit more serious. It's about the sensitive stuff. Perhaps when somebody that you've trusted, that you, you've shared something very personal to, them, and have told everybody. Or it could be that someone's actually uh, telling lies about you. And how do we deal with it? Well, often we, we deal with it very badly. That's, you know, we don't do it well. And uh, but the thing is, if we don't know how to do it, we don't know how to deal with it, it's always the answer is in Scripture. And now really, you know, if you've got the internet, especially, it's so easy to actually put a search in and find the Scriptures that are going to actually help you, help you get through it. You know, I go on about, you know, the, 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 the problems I have with perhaps my computer or whatever. The last thing I do is go to the manual. It's something frustrating. Blood pressure goes up. And if all else fails, I go to the manual. And that's what we do as Christians, you know. Instead of going to Scripture first time round, I don't know whether they had it here in Canada, but in the UK, my daughter used to wear a bracelet with WWJD. What would Jesus do? We can't do better than that, can we? Are they? Or could they? They know not what they're doing. So, what should we do? Matthew uh, 18, verse 15 says this. If your brother or sister sins against you, go and show them their fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established. In other words, and 90% of disputes can be solved by going along in private, not telling anybody else, going along and saying, hey, mate, I've I, I got a problem, you know. This and this has happened and, and I'm, you know, I feel that we've got an unresolved issue here. And what scripture is saying is if that doesn't work, then you need to perhaps involve the elders from church to help resolve that matter. Because it's important. Brothers and sisters should not fall down. So, we know what to do, but when should we do it? That's important as well. Matthew uh, 5, 23 to 24. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, 
Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go to be reconciled to your brother and let and come and offer your gift. So in other words, contact. Shouldn't let the sun go down on an argument. It should be done ASAP, as soon as possible. So, what if the person that you go to and you involve them, for, you know, with the elders of the church, what happens if they say to heck with you? Go and take a run and jump. Well, again, scripture helps us out. Romans 12, verse 18. It is possible as far as it depends on you. Live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. In other words, walk away. Walk away. You've, you've done your bit. I think I shared with you a while ago that uh, back before I went into the ministry and had a, a an issue, a problem with uh, somebody in the church. We had an argument. I felt that I was completely in the right. <laughs> One does this. <laughs> and there was no way I was going to apologise to this guy. And uh, we came to the peace uh, in the church service. And I felt God saying very strongly, you need to go up to this guy and say you're sorry. And it was a struggle. I went up to him and said, I'm sorry. Put my arms around him, gave him a hug, and he looked at me as if I was from another planet. And he never, it was never right between us after that. But I have to say that, that all the um, feeling inside, you know, when you're angry and you feel I have injustice done to you, it went. It disappeared. It wasn't my problem any longer. So just walk away, you'll be fine. That's the second uh, criteria that, that Bill uses for wrongness. The third is uh, a, a lot more serious. Um, the third is a, 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 a when something really, really bad happens to you. Something that's a dreadful injustice. It could be that your child has been killed, drunk and driving. It could be abuse. It could be all of those things. We're talking about radical forgiveness. And, you know, I. We had a, um, a, a dear friend uh, back in Bristol, and uh, her son was a, was a drug addict. And he also had some, uh, some mental issues. And um, they, they kind of messed up his medication. And uh, he was in a severe it wasn't in a, a good place. And uh, there's a bridge in Bristol called uh, the uh, um, Aiden yeah, Suspension Bridge. And it's a long, long, long way up. And uh, she was driving along and, and, and near the suspension bridge. And uh, he uh, jumped out of the car and he ran to the bridge. And, and jumped off. And the river was tidal. It happened that the, the, the river was in, and they think his body was taken out to sea. And this poor lady had to uh, watch a film of her son jumping off the bridge to identify. 
And she couldn't really blame the authorities and stuff, the mess and stuff like that. But, but she didn't. She said, well, you know, this is just a lesson. And, and I hope that people learn from this. And it doesn't happen again to my son. And she didn't blame anybody, and she actually forgave them. And do you know what? Actually, an amazing amount of good came out of that, because, because through her forgiveness, she uh, worked on a bereavement group. And, and, and she, she supported people who had lost family through suicide. Because she'd been there, done it, experienced it. I can never say to anybody, I understand how, you know, how you feel. But she was able to do that because of radical forgiveness. Jesus said, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. And it's easy to say, and you can see all the struggles that, that people have, but unforgiveness is like a, a cancer that eats away at you inside. It might look fairly normal, and inside, it is eating and eating away. And Jesus, what did Jesus do? We know what he would do. What is it? But, you know, when we, we look at the, the greatest scheme of things, number one, you know, the, the irrelevant stuff that we fall out of, but really, really just put it in perspective. You know, we should never, over irrelevant stuff, we should never ever expect people to say, you know, forgive or be offended. We just let it just roll over us and have that everyday rest. Even the second plan, even the second, that's, that's much easier. But, you know, when we read in the papers and we, you know, we know people that have suffered, you know, some really grievous loss, or grievous hurt. We need to pray for them. It's not easy. Um, but the wonderful thing is, is if you speak to some people who have experienced that grace of forgiveness, they forgive them. It releases them. And, you know, that Jesus is right there with me. Difficult message this morning. But it's one that I feel that we really need.